He coined the term the Internet of Things, which the European Commission, the Chinese government and the US National Intelligence Council have all described as one of the major technologies of the 21st century. In 2013, the, t the term was added to the Oxford Dictionaries. That's pretty cool. He's the author of How to Fly a Horse, The Secret History of Creation, Invention and Discovery, which was described by the Toronto Post as the last book about creativity you'll ever need to read. His writing about innovation and technology has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Politico and Quartz. He co-founded the Auto ID Centre at MIT and took it from a converted broom closet to a global organisation with six labs around the world. So a converted broom closet and a word in a dictionary, they're pretty good achievements. He's led three highly successful tech startups, most recently one of which he sold to Belkin in 2010. As a result, Kevin has a unique, real-world perspective on what it takes to build organisations that are innovative and how to be an innovator in organisations that aren't. He's been called the father of the Internet of Things by Newsweek, a modern-day Johnny Appleseed by Wired, and a man who will change the world. Please welcome Kevin Ashton. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a video of you. Feel free to smile or wave or hide your face if you're, if you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will analyze this using Internet of Things technology to see if you're paying attention. No, I'm kidding. Thank you. What, a, what an attractive audience. I'm actually going to tweet that. And the hashtag is hashtag STEMX. That is my gift to you, not the, the image, but the fact that you now have a perfect excuse to look at your phones whenever you want during my presentation. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things and what it is and why it is. Um, but it's sort of a piece of the future. So um, it's sort of an interesting thing about the future, and I just demonstrated it, which is I took this very small thing out of my pocket, and I took a high-definition definition video of everybody here, and then I transmitted it wirelessly to the world, and now thousands of people can look at everybody here in Brisbane, uh, and nobody probably thought that was very remarkable. Had I done it, about 10 years ago, it would have seemed miraculous. Had I predicted that I would be able to do it 12 years ago, that would have seemed ridiculous. So as we talk about the future, one of the patterns to keep in mind is this movement from ridiculous, someone predicts something and it seems like that's never going to happen, that's, that's crazy, to miraculous, which is a period that lasts for about 30 minutes, the first time you get to use something or the first time you see something. And then there's monotonous, which is, well, I've seen that now and I'm used to it and everybody's doing it, what's the big deal? So that's the actual pattern of the future in a way. It's, it's ridiculous, miraculous, monotonous. And I'll give you an example. This picture on the screen behind me is not a picture of planet Earth. Uh, it's a picture of uh, the former planet known as Pluto. It used to be a planet, now it's a planet-like object or, or something. Um, so this is the first ever photograph of Pluto. Yeah, 86 years ago, this was miraculous. 87 years ago, the idea there was anything that far away was ridiculous. And now it's like, wow, that's, that's like, it's like a video game from the 80s, for those people here who remember the 80s. Um, and gradually, things improve. Until you get this, and this. 
So in, in the intervening period, which is not that long, we've gone from, wow, we, we, isn't it amazing we can even see that there's something that far away and get some kind of image to it, of it, to, uh, wow, we built the fastest moving vehicle the human race has ever built so far, and it flew all the way there. And not only did it get there, but it's able to take these amazing images and send them all the way back. Using, by the way, technology that's very similar to the technology I just used in my phone to take a picture of everybody. So this is the pattern of the future. Things kind of just keep improving, and as, as they improve, we sort of forget that they were ever bad. Uh, and as a futurist, uh, you know, my job really these days is to write and talk about the future. Uh, the fact that these things improve in a, a predictable way actually makes my job quite easy. You know, the conclusion I've come to, uh, sort of thinking and talking about the future, is this. Predicting the future is actually easy. What's hard is believing it. Because it seems ridiculous, until it seems miraculous and then seems monotonous. I will now prove this to you. I will make some predictions. If you don't believe them, I'm right. You will own a self-driving car by 2030. We'll talk a little bit more about self-driving cars in a minute because they're an example of the Internet of Things. The, the one possible mistake I've made here, uh, and I made it deliberately, is the word own. Maybe you won't own it. Maybe it'll be a service that you subscribe to. Now, depending on how old you are, your great-grandchildren, your grandchildren, or for some of you, your children, will have a three-digit life expectancy. Can be expected to live to be 100 or more. Now, let me tell you why that's remarkable. 200 years ago, the average life expectancy on the planet was 30. Please raise your hands if you're over 30. Congratulations. 200 years ago, you've been dead by now. And the technology that's enabled, the average life expectancy today is uh, kind of in the 70s, globally, higher in some places. Um, the, the technology that's enabled this long life is going to continue to live a longer life, which is why this, this is a true prediction. Um, depending on where I am in the world, people can get very upset by this. But uh, by sort of 2100, 50% plus one of the human race or more will be vegetarian. It's actually an easy prediction to make, because the numbers are like getting to about 20% right now. And a lot of those people live in India, which is a country with a, a growing population. There are other reasons why this will be true, too. Um, now, in case you're wondering whether I've heard of climate change, because, hey, I'm talking about this great future where people live long lives and cars drive themselves. And, um, I have heard of climate change. Now you may be wondering, do I think climate change is real? Because some people think that climate change is, is a hoax invented by the Chinese or you know, something crazy, United Nations trying to get your money. Um, there's more than two positions you can have on climate change. Okay? The two positions you hear about are there's no such thing as climate change. It's all been made up. Or, oh my god, there is such a thing as climate change and the world is about to end. And the reality is in the middle. There is such a thing as climate change, sorry to the people who don't want to believe it, um, but it's not the end of the world. Some very bad things are going to happen because of climate change, make no mistake, but this is not the end of the human race as we know it. We will survive climate change, we will learn some things that will turn out to be very useful. And here's my last prediction. And this gets us into the Internet of Things. Within 20 years, remember that phrase, within 20 years, most computers will power themselves. Now that can sound weird, because when you think about what a computer is, you probably think about something like a laptop or a smartphone or something. It's a device that has a screen, it has a network connection, it has a memory, um, and you know that you need to plug it in probably every night to charge it up. 
So how could this possibly be true, that most computers will power themselves? Well, it's true because all those things I just described, the screen and the memory and everything, are not the computer. Computer is just a fancy word for automatic calculation. Computing is calculating automatically. The things that consume the power on your laptop or your phone are the display and the network connection and the hard drive. The computing piece actually doesn't take that much power. In the 1900s, when we talked about computing, we talked about a thing called Moore's Law. You may be familiar with it. If you're not, what Moore's Law said was that uh, basically you could get the same computing power in half the space every 18 to 24 months, which is why in the 20th century computers kept getting smaller, they kept getting faster. Moore's Law is still with us, but computers have got about as small and fast as we need most of the time. What's the equivalent of Moore's law in the 21st century is this. This is called Kumi's law. It's named after a professor called Jonathan Kumi. Um, and what it says is that the amount of energy, so the amount of electricity, basically, needed to perform a computation, or this calculation, has halved every 18 months since computing began. So you kind of see the history of computing here. So in the 1940s and 1950s, we got the first computers. They're called things like ENIAC, EDVAC, UNIVAC. Uh, in sort of the late 1970s and 1980s, these were personal computers, the first computers you could use at home, Altair, Macintosh. Uh, and then we're going to get up to date with laptops and things that you've probably heard of. What's been happening in this time is the amount of electrical energy needed to do computing has halved every 18 months very consistently. Which is why you can do more with your iPhone 7 than you could do with your iPhone 1 on the same battery charge. Battery technology is improving too, but one of the reasons is Kumi's law. Now what's interesting about this is you can kind of flip it and you can say the amount of energy you need is getting lower and lower every 18 months, which is an incredibly aggressive trend. And it takes us to the point where computers don't need any electricity at all, or barely any electricity at all. And the best example of a computer that doesn't need any electricity is something called an RFID tag. It's a little thing about the size of a postage stamp. There's a picture of it there. Uh, and all it knows how to do is explain what its number is. And I'm comparing it here to a smartphone, which everyone is familiar with. An RFID tag is a little computer that has no battery. It gets its power, in nearly every case, it gets its power from the radio waves that are communicating with it. There's barely any energy in a radio wave. You do not need to wear a tin foil hat, okay? But because of Kumi's law, there's now just enough to make the computer and the RFID tag work. So you have this little wirelessly networked computer that doesn't require a battery. And the interesting thing, and this is why it's a little bit of a trick with my last prediction, uh, every year for the last few years, we have produced one billion more RFID tags a year than we have smartphones. Smartphones are the dominant form of computing today but there are more RFID tags. So many more, in fact, that about half the world's computers are RFID tags, they don't have power. What are they being used for? They're being used for stuff like getting through toll lanes more quickly, or um, pay wave is an RFID technology. Hotel rooms, badges that get you in and out of buildings, and so on, that's why there are so many of these things. And they're powering the Internet of Things. Before I talk about what the Internet of Things is, I want to talk about what the Internet of Things isn't, very quickly. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding. So these are examples of not the Internet of Things. Okay? Uh, they're real. This is a smart wine bottle. Connects to an app on your phone, tells you whether or not you're drunk. If you need an app to tell you whether or not you're drunk, you're drunk. Um, smart bikini tells you whether or not you're getting sunburned. If you need a bikini to tell you whether or not you're getting sunburned, you're drunk. Um, 
smart water bottle, it's a day after now, you didn't have the app, you didn't know you were drunk, have you had enough to drink? If you're thirsty, you have not had enough to drink, you don't need an app. Uh, my personal favorite, the smart shaver, did you shave today? Probably still hung over from not knowing you were drunk. I did not shave today, I don't need an app to tell me that. Okay, this is not the Internet of Things. This is what you hear about in the news sometimes. But what the Internet of Things is, there are some very important networks in the world that are not the Internet. This is one of them. These are the world's airline routes. These are planes flying around. What do planes contain? They don't contain data, they contain things. They contain people and cargo. World's shipping lanes are very important to this nation. Again, things moving around, not data, not information. These are networks upon which we depend for our survival. Here's the internet. These are the bits of the internet that move from country to country. All those things moving around require a lot of information. The internet should be able to provide information about things moving around the world, but there's a problem. And the problem is, in the 20th century, computers got their information from people via keyboards. And people aren't very good at monitoring the world of things. Things change in real time, there are lots of them, they're very detailed. People typing on keyboards is not the way to understand this world. So how do you do it? You give computers their own senses. An RFID tag is an example of a sense for a computer. You gather information about the world automatically, not via a keyboard, via sensors attached to the internet. That gives you a whole bunch of data. You analyze that data not by looking at it on a spreadsheet, but by using a technology called machine learning. In the popular press, it's often called artificial intelligence, which is a terrible name because it's not really artificial intelligence. It's just very advanced mathematics. But you look at that data, and the machine reaches a decision. It may communicate that decision to a person who does something. It may communicate that decision to a machine that does something. But somehow, the decision changes the world. The sensors in the Internet of Things notice the change in the world, and the whole process starts all over again. Example of Internet of Things sensors? One, GPS. A network sensor that means your phone knows where you are even when you don't. What can you do with that? Well, there's the obvious things like navigation. But because it's connected to the network, you can also get traffic information in real time. All these devices moving around, communicating where they are and how fast they're moving. Or you can do unexpected stuff. Another sensor, the phone on your camera. There were very few of these a few years ago. There are lots today. It's like an eye for the network. Oh, <gasps> What happens if you can find the camera on your phone with the GPS on your phone? Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is an Internet of Things application. Now, the question to ask yourself is, what else could you do with this type of technology? Not just games. How could you help people? What could you invent that's really cool? One thing you could invent is a self-driving car. This is what the world looks like to a self-driving car. One of the things people say about self-driving cars is, but will they be safe? Wrong question. The right question is, are cars driven by people safe? What do you think? Heck no. Nearly 3,300 people killed by human-driven cars every single day. 95% of them attributed to what's politely called human error. If you're drunk while playing the violin, while texting, while driving at 90 miles an hour and you kill somebody, that is not human error. When people think about self-driving cars, they think about something like this. This is a Tesla, has autopilot. But the interesting thing about the Internet of Things is it's kind of all around us and we don't know it. In fact, one of the biggest fleets and earliest fleets of self-driving vehicles was right here in Australia. Not at this end of Australia, at the other end of Australia. 
This picture was taken in Pinjara, which is way out west, if you don't know where that is. It's a Rio Tinto zinc mine. This truck is about eight meters high, and it drives itself. Why? Have you ever been to Pinjara? Nobody wants to live there. You have to pay someone like $200,000 a year to drive this truck. And, and they still want to leave because there's nowhere to spend the money. So instead, the truck drives itself. It gathers a raw material called bauxite, which is turned into aluminum, which is turned into things like soda cans. Next time you drink a can of soda, that was delivered to you in part by a self-driving vehicle, way out west. What else does the Internet of Things have to do with Australia? Well, this is where I'll finish, and I want to leave you with, with a couple of thoughts. Um, one of the things that is a predictor of both creating and innovating in general, but also whether a nation is going to be an adopter and developer of Internet of Things technology, is urbanization. What percentage of your population live in cities? There are lots of reasons why. Cities are good for creating. Cities need the Internet of Things. Nations that are more urbanized than most tend to be better at delivering technology. Australia has always been and continues to be far more urbanized than most of the world and, and continues to grow. So cities like Brisbane are engines for innovation and engines for innovation in the Internet of Things. And I can prove that to you. Is Australia a high-tech nation? Is Australia a high-tech exporter? Doesn't all that stuff happen in Silicon Valley? Nah, not really. I mean, kind of, but not as much as you might think. Here's the growth of tech exports in the world, in the United States, and in Australia over the last few decades. Now, this is growth. This is how much things are growing. So we have the world in yellow, all the tech exports put together. And what you see is the line is basically flat with a little bit of a dip during the recession. The world's technology exports have stayed basically the same throughout this period. What about the United States? Well, it grew. It was big in the 80s and 90s, and it flattened out in the 2000s, had a big decline that it's never recovered from in the last decade. Australia is the red line. Now, the value of Australia's tech exports is relatively small compared to the United States, but the growth is huge. That urbanization and the creative abilities of the people in this country are driving a tremendous growth in innovation and technology right now. Australia is positioned to be one of the leading developers of technology and Internet of Things technology in the 21st century. But it's up to you guys in particular to take advantage of that and make it true. Are you seriously done? <laughs>